Get $10 off your next $50 or more purchase when you sign up for text alerts from Academy Sports and Outdoors. Text the word FISHING to 22369. Once again, that's FISHING to 22369. Offer expires 731 of 2022, and message and data rates may apply. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Big Sharks from the Surf. I'm going to be talking with River and Brian Lester of Hatter Style Custom Rods and Tackle out of the Buxton area. We're going to be talking about water temperature, conditions, bait, gear, and techniques. I'm Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003, bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and here in our great latest and greatest effort, the podcast series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And in this pursuit, I am joined, just as I am every week, by Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative, Billy, we're getting ready to talk sharks from the surf. Are you in? Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I'm very curious because, uh, <clears throat> well, as I mention all the time, Gary don't have a boat, so the surf is my sp- my space. So hopefully we can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we you know one question I'd like for you to ask is how do I get a shark in, check it out, without get my fingers ripped off. I mean, that'd be my number one question. So if you can pass that along if you remember. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that's important. I'm guessing there'll be <laughs> at least a. <laughs> Uh, at least a token mention of safety oh. in this conversation, if not if not a little <laughs> bit more than a token. That's my guess. Oh, man. Well, speaking of boats, want to give a shout out to our sponsors really quickly. Uh, I'll start out with Lawnmowers first, Bland Landscaping. Uh, make sure you reach out to these guys. If you're looking for a career this year, they are looking for people in all kinds of different markets, and they cover a lot of markets in the North Carolina area. So be sure to reach out to them, Bland Landscaping Company. And also, if you are the head of any type of associations, uh, property associations, anything like that, and you need a, a, lands, a reliable landscaping company, be sure to reach out and give Bland Landscaping a call, and they can get, get you taken care of. So Yeah, man. Um, I'm not I'm not wearing my bland landscaping hat right now, but I've been wearing it lately on fishing trips. So hopefully you guys will pick up on that in Fisherman's Post social media efforts. Yeah, it's all the fish that the captain caught and handed Gary. That's what he's giving me pictures with. I cannot confirm nor deny. <laughs> all right, and then our next sponsor, Marine Warehouse Center. We get a quick word from them. We'll be right back. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything from trailer, trailer parts, engines, engine parts, new boats, boat parts, a full store. We have a service department. We are your one-stop shop for marine equipment and hardware. We offer a wide variety of parts and accessories for all your marine needs. The best part about working at Marine Warehouse Center is to help customers really get the most out of their coastal lifestyle and share our love for the water. At Marine Warehouse, we're here to get you out on the water because of our love for the water. We like being out there and we want you out there with us. All right, there you go, Gary. Good dude. That's the crew, man. man. They that are. Is the crew. They take care of the fish post boat. Yeah, they got a good team over there from their marketing department to sales and service and parts and even fishing stuff, tackle stuff. You saw it there. So you guys go check those out and support them. And I would say say hello to Emmett, but Gary, um, we're trying to figure out where in the world is Emmett. Where in the world is Emmett? And you have no clue. By the way, this is uh, this is something you have no clue about. And so it's my job to cue Gary up with some hints. And Emmett's been hanging out with the new crowd here recently. It's uh, kind right. of interesting. Um, but one, but but the kind of crowd he's hanging out with are pretty interesting beings i will say or an- i'll say animals that's one hint for you animals animals hanging out with animals yeah hanging out with animals and this particular type of animal their meat is consumed is the most consumed meat per capita worldwide can you guess where emmett is hanging out at a field of cows no not cows he's actually Chickens. hanging out with some goats ah. Gary. look at this <laughs> he sure is He's, he's a goat hug, hug, hugger, not even herder. He's a goat hugger with a cowboy <laughs> hat and a tie dye. Man, that is that is Emmett. If I ever saw Emmett, Emmett's looking yeah, looking good there, Emmett. Good People job. eat more goats than cows or chickens. I mean, according to my very quick Google search, and you got to trust the internet. I mean, it's the look at internet us. Internet doesn't lie. That's where we're at right now. That's where people are listening <laughs> to us from. We're not liars. If the internet said it, then I guess we're eating a bunch of goats. Yeah. 
So anyway, that's where M's at. If you don't see him around the shop, he's out hugging goats, herding goats, or whatever, or maybe slaughtering goats. I don't know, but yeah, interesting. Well, people are eating a lot of fish. Yeah, but they're not necessarily eating the fish that we're getting ready to show on our fish photo. God, Gary, what a segue, man! High five. Here we go. We got David Gay from Selma caught and releases forty-inch red drum on cut bait at Ramp Fifty Five in Hatteras. Uh, I should have zoomed. I should have pulled that photo in just a little bit more. Uh, so we can measure it, but it looks good. It's a Does it look good? I, again, I don't know, Mr. Gay, but I'm, I'll ask. I'm going to ask the Lesters when we bring them on if that looks like a 40-inch red drum. They've seen more 40-inch red drum from the surf than anyone <laughs> I know. So, uh, we're, I mean, maybe they know Mr. Gay, and they're just going to say, uh-huh, if that's what he said, that's what he said. But <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm not calling him a liar. I'm just, question, I'm just asking a question out loud. Yeah, right? So this is another reason why you guys should send in your photos to Fisherman's Post because Gary, you know. I mean, you we can, can say guess. anything. <laughs> you can say anything. He'll publish it. He doesn't care. Here, the newspaper, uh, the website. <laughs> Whatever you want to be known for, you can be known for. Anyhow, anyhow. Send in your photos. And you know what else you can do? You can go on Fisherman'sPost.com and you can check out our weekly fishing reports, weekly inshore fishing reports, new this year, started in April delivered in audio and video format, delivered every Thursday. It is behind a paywall, so it takes a small fee. But if you've been thinking, man, I really dig Fisherman's Post efforts. I dig the newspaper every month when it comes out, or I dig reading it, the new reports every month when they're updated online, but I wish I could get it more regular. Well, this is our answer. Weekly inshore fishing reports from up and down the entire North Carolina coast. Every Thursday, audio, video delivery, small fee. Please check us out fishermanspost.com that's a good plug gary yeah man and it's pretty neat too because it's you know a lot of tips and tricks in there, strategies as well as these captains are being very generous with their time and effort and uh i mean really telling us more than just like yeah the fishing's good like they're going into detail of you know some rigs and stuff they're using so a lot of a lot of good information there man really enjoying it but right now the star of the show is going to be the lester's and we're going to be talking shark fishing from the surf, land-based shark fishing, a couple of different ways you can word it. And I'm um, looking forward to this conversation. I don't know if you remember, Billy, you probably do. You're better with numbers than me. But Brian's podcast on Big Citation Drum from the Point, one of our most popular podcasts yeah. to date. So I'm excited that we have both him and his son. Not the son that mugged the screen when he was doing <laughs> Red Drum. Not that son. I think we got a different one. <laughs> Unless they ate some hormonal milk out there and this kid sprouted it <laughs> out like... <laughs> three feet and <laughs> 100 pounds but uh yeah man i'm gonna say billy's best takeaway so when i'm done with my conversation with the lesters billy's best takeaway to wrap this thing up all right man i'm excited all right well hey welcome to the show river and brian lester again hatteras style custom rods and tackle out of the buxton area right there in the town of buxton Thank you so much for joining us, guys. I know it's busy out there. I know it's the height of the season. I very much appreciate you <coughs> making this time for us. Yeah, man. Sure thing. <laughs> well, well, listen, even though you had one of our most popular podcasts, you still got to go through the routine of two questions. You tell me you're ready for <laughs> question number one. I give you question number one. We're ready. Question number one. Why should we listen to anything either of you have to say about fishing for sharks from land? Because they just don't catch them as big as we do. <laughs> How long have you been doing it? A long time. 25 plus years. Um, right on. Man, that goes through. I mean, again, you guys can say anything and I'm pushing you through. Now, not, question number two is my non-fishing related question. You ever seen the movie Jaws? Yep. All right. Well, this is a shark question. So I went to the movie Jaws. Finish this most famous line from Jaws. You're going to need a bigger boat. Right on, man. There you go. And it was ad-libbed. How about that fun fact? That wasn't even in the script. That was ad-libbed by that actor. He he put it in there. Yep. Oh, you knew that too, huh? Yeah, we just took a huge Jaws movie quiz. My wife quizzed me on it. It's <laughs> funny. About a, about a week ago, because she knows I know everything about it. Favorite movie. Um, I'm with it, man. Well, well, thank you very much. Let's go to the Let's go to the topic. Big sharks yep. from the surf. I know in talking to you before we set the show up, you said it starts in the spring and lasts till about October. This is going to yep. be released on June 28th. So I think we're really focusing in on the July, August months. 
But I think yeah. people are curious in general about what you guys see as the shark season out there in Buxton. So first, walk me through the season. What are you targeting in the spring? What in the summer? What in the early fall? Um, springtime, it's it's we try to target the scallop hammerheads more than anything. Um, there is some duskies running around, but in the spring, it's the scallop hammerhead. I mean, pound for pound, probably the hardest fighting fish out there for its size. Unbelievable power. Man, and that was dusky. I'm sorry, I had a little glitch on my um, end. That's a, scalloped hammerheads and uh then you know we also find some duskies around in the spring um and stuff like that but you know again pound for pound a scalloped hammerhead is is just top notch it, it's just it, it'll test your gear and your ability and strength i mean it's just all the way around they're, they're just heavy hitters and what's the typical size of those hammer of those scallop um, hammerheads the scallop hammerhead runs anywhere I mean, we catch them anywhere from about six foot to ten foot. All right. And now, what about what about July and August, man? What's the primary target species, tar um, shark species? Then, in July and August, we we really try to target the greater hammerheads and as well as the uh, the tiger sharks. And that's then, kind of our main deal in in July, August, and September. And then, give me a size reference for those species, please. Um, anywhere from, I mean, we've caught them from, you know, eight foot all the way to the, the largest we've ever caught them was 15 foot. All right. So if I'm targeting these species, if I'm, if I'm, ha if I'm watching this podcast or listening to this podcast and I'm thinking, man, I want to give this a shot in July and August, what do I do, man? Can I walk out anywhere there in the Buxton area? I'm guessing there's got to be certain conditions that are more favorable. It is. It's warm water. Um, you got to be able to read the beach. You know, we don't catch a lot of tigers here on the island. And uh, I'll start with that first. The, the, you know, tigers are more, we've caught them more in the shallower water than we have the deeper water. Um, but it, it, you got to have your game together when you come to the beach. So it's not like you're going to take a rod out and just cast it and catch these big tigers and these big hammers. It doesn't work like that. Um, we target these fish with big gear, something that you'd see on a boat for marlin fishing. You know, they're 80s and 130s. That's what we use to target these bigger fish. Um, not saying it's 100% required, but for the protection of the fish the idea is to catch this thing get it in as fast as possible with a safe comfortable release that's the whole idea of the shark fishing you know i mean you got to have your gear right you got to have your game together so it's not anything that you're just going to go buy at walmart and go out and catch these big sharks it's not happening i mean it's it's a big real game all right so man i know very little so i'm going to ask some questions Tell me the yeah. difference in your mind between shallow water and deeper water. Well, shallow water, um, you know, for some reason, the tigers we have caught from experience have always been in a, in a, in the shallow water. You know, we've caught them in it. I, when I say shallow, I'm talking anywhere from, you know, nine to, to 16 feet of water is what we've caught them in. And for some reason, I feel like they're a flat and I, I don't want to say a flats fish, but I mean, I think they feed more in shallow water than what they do the deeper water. Not that you can't catch them in deeper. It's just from our experience, we've caught more in shallow water than we have, you know, in, in deep water. So don't know why. Um, that's just, yeah, that's what we've done. You know, when we want to target them. We look for, you know, eight, 10, 12 to 16 foot of water and we, we deploy baits and drop it. All right. So you mentioned reading the surf and I know you, I know you can't just drop 20 years of knowledge in a two minute answer, but as far as like reading the surf, if someone was thinking shallower, nine to 16 feet, tiger shark, what are they, when they walk out on the beach, what are they looking for? I mean, are, it's kind are of that is it's, it takes a long time to figure it out. I mean, it, it does. It, it's for an example, um, in, in Frisco, Frisco has a long flat beach and you can tell it's not a deep pocket. You have a, you know, your it's consecutive bars. I mean, when you see deeper water, you know, there's an, a 
an outer bar, say a hundred yards off the beach, you can see it swelling and starting to crest on the outer bar. Then a really deep pocket that runs from there to the beach. So, I mean, that's a deep, for a pocket of water when i mean when i say shallower water you can tell by the color of the water when you get these real pretty days um you've got your water that you know greenish you know kind of water kind of teal looking that's really really you can tell that that's a shallower water and when you see your deep water is when it starts to turn that that deep blue you know and you can just it's a deeper pocket is darker than what a a, a a shallow pocket of water is kind of greenish looking, you know, and you can tell by that. But I mean, it all comes from experience. I mean, and in all honesty, from from Frisco, I'm going to say from Frisco south towards Sandy Bay and down towards Hatteras, that's all kind of a flat, you know, beach. It, it gradually falls versus something in the actual, which we call it the bite, which is the hook in between. 40 ramp 48 and in the point and that's a deep pocket of water i mean that falls out man that'll go from uh, 50 yards off the beach it drops out 16 feet and then drops on from there up to 30 feet okay. i mean that's a deep body of water and so, you can tell by the well the waves you can tell by how the waves are breaking i mean you know you can tell how far that white water rolls in whether it's deep you know a deeper pocket of water if it's breaking way out on the bar and as soon as it comes off that bar, the white water goes away and it flattens out. It's deep right on this side of the bar. And and in a shallow water doesn't do that. It'll keep, you know, kind of white foamy water all the way to the beach. I follow that. I follow that completely. So as far as water temperature, you say the warmer water. I guess my question would be, and it seems like we're talking about tigers now. Man, uh, what would be the water temperature that would make you think, all right, man, this season's about to kick off? And then I guess just in general, because, again, I'm coming to this podcast with little to no pre-knowledge. I mean, are we talking day and night? Are we talking about you like it a little sloppy like red drum fishing or you like it calm? What What is it that gives you the most confidence that today or tonight's going to be the night? I mean, I look for anywhere from 75 to 78 degree water. Um, pretty calm, you know, nighttime dusk is always, in my opinion, and night are more productive than daytime. We have caught our largest hammerhead and hammerheads during the day, you know, and we've caught some really big ones at night, but, um, you know, it, it, it's, I like it calm. I don't like it super windy. I kind of like it laid out. You know, I like calmer water. In my opinion, I, I've always caught more fish in calmer water than what I have, you know, really rough seas. All right. And then I have down here, like, bait choices. So if if we're continuing to talk about tigers, what is it, what is the bait that I want to be armed with? Well, me and my son, we kind of argue about this all the time. You know, what what bait, you know, he he's, he's 17 and knows it all. But uh, he... Uh, He's a, he's a blood bait guy. So he likes, you know, blood baits. For an example, like albacores. Um, he, he, he loves albacores. He runs some tuna heads. I don't like them. I don't care about them. Um, but um, he, he's 100%. He's a blood bait guy. And, you know, mostly the, the fresh albacore. You know, me, I mean, I, I guess you could call it all blood baits. When I say blood baits, I'm talking like fish. So whole blackfin tunas or or whole albacores and me I'm kind of different I I I like the stingrays you know that's that's probably what I like to use stingray I mean and don't get me wrong we've caught more tigers on uh, on blood baits than we have the stingrays but um on the actual fish but it's I don't know I mean it's to each his own really I mean they all work great but a long soak bait the reason I like the stingrays. <clears throat> is there's not a lot see when you're trying to fish for these tigers and these hammers man you got these nuisance black tips and spinner sharks that that just i mean well absolutely i mean the time and effort that goes into to getting these baits out there and and getting everything prepped to do it and then you got a a six or seven foot black tip that just wrecks your crap and it's like come on so that's why i tend to stay away from blood baits i'm more of a Stingray guy, very seldom I've caught a black tip on Stingray. 
you know, a whole stingray or a, a wing or something like that. So they kind of leave it alone. So therefore, I, I know when something hits that ray, it's going to be a big fish, regardless whether tiger or hammer, it's going to be a big one. River, does he have you correct, man? Is a uh, whole albacore your favorite bait? Yes, sir, it is. What would be number two? Jack or a um, dogfish. And are these all, is everything we're talking about whole baits? Is jack or dogfish or albacore, you're putting the whole fish on that hook? Uh, the albacore, we run whole. Um, yeah, we do, depending on size. I mean, a five to eight pounder, 10 pounder, we do run whole. Now, when it comes to these big jack crevels, I mean, I've got some out right in front of my truck in the box out there and they're you know they're 30 35 pounds a piece so i mean we do we will cut them in two different baits um and the stingrays a lot of times we'll run you know depend on if it's what we call one baiter or is it a you know a two baiter so a 30 pound stingray we'll get two you know three chunks of bait out of and a lot of the rays we have now that you know we're buying for shark baiter you know they're five to 10 pounders which we use as single baits well man tell me a little bit about the tackle tell me a little bit about the rigs that are holding this bait and holding up to the force of a shark bite shark fight well um what we do is we run uh, a lot of people are confused with it think they have to run you know uh, 50 foot of cable and that's not the, that's not the case i mean what we do is we run it's lp line it's a mono um we build a lot of our shark rigs with either the the, the 700 pound 900 pound or the 1200 pound and <clears throat> what we generally try to do is run our our rigs at about 50 feet you know is what we like them 40 to 50 feet and what that does is it gives once you get the shark close enough to the beach I can physically, my son is the real man. I'm the leader man. That's how we do it. You got to kind of have your positions like anything else. So it gives me room to when that big fish gets to the beach, I've got say 50 feet of, of, of 900 pound LP. I can grab the leader and take the pressure off of the rod man, you know, and we leader this fish into the beach. So the hooks we use are a sandbar tackle, 20 ot inline circle hook. So that is a law now in the state of North Carolina, and I do believe it's the East Coast, is um, it has to be an inline circle hook only. So the hooks we use are 20 odd inline circle hooks, and we run uh, um, probably four feet of, uh, of either 900 pound cable, coated cable, or number 19 hardwire twisted together with haywire twists and we wire our hook into that so it's uh it's not too complicated once you see it trying to tell you how to do it it's it's kind of weird but um anyway say 40 foot of of 900 pound uh lp with four foot of cable and you've got an actual uh, ball bearing snap swivel is what we use to to anchor our our bait to the to the bottom and pretty much that's it man i mean it ties to your line it, it's uh kind of it's it's a no-brainer once you see them once you've done it i mean it's it's that's it so as i follow that i'm going to guess that if i'm watching or listening to this podcast and i'm into it i can walk into hatter style custom rods and tackle and you got these tied up or i can pay you to tie them up no we got them we've got them we've got all our rigs custom rigs already done hanging on the shelf and if somebody comes in and decides they they have something in their mind they want us to rig, we rig it. We got a full rigging station. We've got from from a uh, 300 pound LP on uh, 25 pound spools all the way up to 1200 LP. We've got all the crimps. We've got all the hooks. We've got everything we need. We've got the largest sharking rigging station on the Outer Banks. Right on. So now tell me a little bit about what line you're tying this to. And not just the line, but the rod and reel. And I guess I would say, you know, you guys are specialty, so I'm sure you have your favorite outfit to use for big shark fishing. And then maybe tell me, since not everyone's going to be as specialty, like what I can get away with using. Um, well, I mean, the line, we well, let's start with the rod. I mean, the rods, 
what we use are, you know, I mean, I do build rods for a living, but I, we use, it's, it's out of Galveston, Texas. A good friend of mine, Mike Goings designed the rod. We use the steadfast, uh, medium heavy to all the way to the extra heavy rods. Um, you know, we build these things with detachable butts. The, you know, it, it's the reels we use are anywhere. We, we use a lot of the Abit reels. Abit, Abbott, and whatever you want to call them. Um, the 80s, the 130 TRXs, the EXWs. Um, you know, my son uses a uh, 130 um, IU Technos. That's his kind of favorite reel. Me, I guess, being older and things are heavy, I kind of like using the 80s, you know, and you can get it done with an 80. And I'm not saying you can't get it done with a 50 wide either. A 50 wide will do it. Um, you know, it's all about the amount of drag you put on them and how you're rigged up. So, I mean, the whole deal is, man, when you, you want to get into this game, you better step correct because it's not – it's no joke. It is absolutely no joke. I mean, to really get into this, people don't understand the power that these big fish have. And, uh, I mean, I've seen 50s and I've seen 80s and 130s that are 100% get dumped. When I say get dumped, I mean completely spooled and could not stop the fish. So, I mean, it's again, it's not something you're just going to pick up off the shelf and, oh, I'm going shark fishing. Now, if you want to go out and cast for these black tips and spinners and sand tigers and, and even the duskies, we catch a lot of scallop hammerheads in the spring on casting gear. But again, boy, they'll give you a run for your money. They're, they're just powerhouses, especially the scallop hammerheads. Sand tigers, not so much. It's like reeling in a, a tractor tire, you know, but they got the, the gnarliest teeth out there. So it, it's, uh, and, and you can get away with a 50. I mean, I know a lot of guys do. A friend of mine that, that lives down towards Topsail, man, that he likes them smaller 50 wides and he catches some nice fish with them. Some nice fish it is, you know, but he's a very experienced angler. So he's not, someone that's just stepping into this he knows the pros and cons of what he can do he's he's always tinkering up upgrading drags i mean he he just he knows what he's doing and he can do it i have faith that he can do it now is he gonna uh, land a uh 13 12 13 14 foot greater hammerhead on a 50 i don't know it's kind of iffy you know i mean it all depends on how much power that fish has and how bad he wants to get away all right so I am following this and I'm not surprised at this. Like, I mean, this is a specialty fishing and I had no illusion that someone could watch this podcast and then just go out and do it. So I knew this was going to be sort of a stepping off and an introduction to you and your shop as a resource if people wanted to go this route. So in that Mm -hmm. spirit, man, if I were to hang out with you, you know, you and your son and you were to let me tag along for an early evening session of big shark fishing, Tell me what would yep. happen once we got out on the beach. Um, all depends. I mean, you know, we don't find them every time. We spend more time sitting there waiting than what we do catching, you know. And then there's some days we'll we'll catch, you know, one, two, three in the evening. So, but again, it's kind of one of those things that, you know, my son does uh, shark charters. So he does do that, and we he did a lot last year and a lot year before. So, um, you know, people come down, and, and what we do is to occupy people. I mean, we give them that choice. Do they just want to go catch a shark, or they want to really catch a big one? Because, I mean, you've got to put your time in. Some people get lucky, but you've got to put in the work to catch these big fish. So, I mean, hey, man, you might go out with us, and one night we catch two monster, just big fish. and then. I take a guy the next night, the next week, we might not catch one. You know, it's kind of that, that thing is, is, is in my opinion, when we target these real big sharks, it's a waiting game and that's what it is. I mean, you know, these, these big greater hammerheads, you know, they, they're not a schooling type fish. They're not like a black tip or a spinner. These things are more, more of a loner. So, I mean, not that there won't be two or three together, but they're, they're big for a reason they're smart they're not stupid whatsoever they are smart but i mean to go with us and do it oh yeah we can cast some baits out for you and we'll let you catch black tips and spinners all night long 
you know, five, six, seven footers all evening long if that's what you want to catch. But for these big ones, just be ready to sit there and wait. All right. Well, I think you're actually giving me too much credit. I mean, before I even get to the waiting game, how am I getting, how are you getting those big blood baits or stingray baits out there in position? I I know nothing. <laughs> I got I got my this guy right here sitting beside me. He's uh he's the he's the bait man. He he deploys the bait, so it's kayak. Um, you know, we've got some friends that do have the aqua cats, which is kind of like a drone boat that does deploy the baits and they work great. But um we still deploy with kayak. I mean, that's what we do. My son, we we he he hooks anchor to the kayak and uh Hey man, he paddles these things out, you know, and, and, and that's it. We drop them. And that's another thing you've got to pay attention to as well as is distance. You know, I know guys that come down here, man. And I, I just heard it last week. Guys said, man, I've been down here for a week, hadn't caught a fish. Well, uh, I mean, he's wanting to deploy baits five, six, eight hundred thousand yards off the beach. That's not necessary, not needed whatsoever. Not saying you can't catch one there, but I mean, I can dump a hundred to two hundred yards off the beach, and, and 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 there they are. So it's not, you know. But again, it's kayak. He deploys everything by kayak. So river is that putting the bait like just on the top of the kayak and paddling out while it's balanced up there? And then I guess my other question is, and again, I know nothing, so forgive me. But are you using like an anchor rod, like you might kingfish from a pier, or are you just putting enough weight? on this rig for it to hold bottom and then the shark picks up the bait and the weight and you're fighting both. Well, that's kind of what it is. It's not that it's that much weight. It's a, it's, I'm sure you've seen a kingfish anchor. They throw off the pier to anchor to the bottom. Yes. Same thing. Same thing. We just pour our own. They're a little bit heavier, anywhere from 16 to 30 ounces. And we use stainless TIG wire as the, the actual anchor sides. So um, that's what, you know, it anchors it to the bottom. It's not that they're heavy, but what it does is, is it creates, once that thing's anchored, that's four foot from the bait. So when the fish picks that up and he starts running, the reel starts going off on the beach, that anchor's locked in the bottom and it almost creates like a mouse trap effect, if you know what I mean. So when that thing, he's got to pull that anchor, a lot of times that, that'll half set the hook for you. So that's all it is, man. He throws at the bait and he throws in between his feet or in the back of the kayak. Make sure the hook's nowhere near him, and he he just takes that anchor and bends that prong through the side of the loop on the kayak, and he he's gone. You know, and we got we do use radios; it's a little bit easier. So, um, marine radios to where I can call him and let him know kind of where I want it dropped and how far to go. And you know, there's a lot I can see from the beach that he can't. You know, color change, tide lines. So, I mean, that that's the whole deal. But old school man, put it in the kayak and go. <laughs> I like it. I'm liking everything about this so far. So now you've helped me understand about getting the bait in position. You've briefed mm -hmm. me that it's a waiting game. So now walk me through what happens if I'm fortunate enough. And yeah, I'm I don't want I don't want the spinners. I want to play for I want to play for big fish. Walk me through what happens after we are fortunate enough to get a bite from a big shark. Well, we're gonna let him eat. So when he hits that rod and it starts going off, seconds. we're going to, I'm going to put a little bit of drag on him, but I'm just going to let him go, let him go, let him go, and just kind of let him eat it. And while he's eating it, River would be getting in a harness. So um, a bucket harness with a fighting plate, he'd be getting in that. And uh, I'd transfer the rod from the spike to him. And uh, that's kind of it, you know, um, once he hooks it, he hooks it. He fights a fish. And in the meantime, as soon as he's hooked up and we got a good hook set on it and say you were out with us and you've never done it. So you're getting ready to go in a harness. So we carry two harnesses on the beach with us at all times. So we'd fit you in the harness, get you ready. And uh, that's it. Just like fighting a marlin standing up in a boat. I mean, that that's it. You're on the beach standing up. The only difference is the beach doesn't move, move and the boat does. So you just you're in a harness. You're set up bucket harness you're sitting there and and you're just you're fighting for all you got so is that drag pretty you say that drags pretty light to start with like 
like king macro light like, or light or just not i mean we down. normally we, we normally run off of the beach five to well three to five pounds of drag so when he hits it it is you know not super loose to where it, it, it can knock the reel back in the reel but um well he just pulls out on it and man when that and but here's the deal once you get in the harness and he's running you're going straight to strike so you jam that thing up in strike and you got about 50 pounds, 60 pounds of drag on that thing, if not more, just be ready. We'll have somebody holding you in the harness and you're fighting the fish. That's it. And I'm not getting in it. We're not chasing that fish up and down the beach with me in the back of a truck, man. I'm, I'm on my feet and I can walk left or right, but I'm only walking. I ain't riding. That's it. That's it. No riding. No, that's it. I mean, like again, you know, he's only going to go so far before we'll make him turn. And when he turns, you just come up. I mean, you got to fight as hard as you can to keep him where he's at. So he's going to run up and down the beach. You know, have we walked up and down the beach? Absolutely. Have we driven up and down the beach? Absolutely. But it's it's too much of a headache. We've lost too many fish doing that. You know what? When he goes, he's not going to beat 99.9% .9 of the time. He's not going to beat himself. So when you put enough heat on that fish, he's going to turn and come back around. So is the typical run straight offshore or does it go left and right? Well, I mean, it's happened all different ways. I've had them run straight off. And what they do is they try to, they use that bar to their advantage. You know, if there's an outer sandbar, they use that to their advantage. So, I mean, that's what they're going to them. That's what they do. So, I mean, it's, I have had them run straight straight out but it didn't last long before they're going right or left they'll use that bar sandbar and, and that current to their advantage they are not dumb by any means and what is it is it like a big big first run or is it just multiple runs because this is a fish that is willful and smart well i mean i've had it happen both ways i've had some of the biggest hammerheads we've ever caught slack the line completely out to the beach and thinking you had a swim through or a cutoff, you know, and then realize after you reel 200 yards of line up or not that much, but I mean, 80 yards of line, you're like, Oh no. I mean, I had the biggest one we ever caught it completely. I mean, we were all just hanging out on the beach. You know, we had a couple rods out up on, on Avon beach and that stupid thing, man, I, I looked around, everybody's kind of dozing off middle of the day. It's hot under canopies. And I walk over to, so, well, this stupid thing, uh, it's slack. So apparently something cut it off. So I just real, you know, kept reeling. I said, well, maybe it's not. I don't know what that was. And, uh, hey, man, I'm going to tell you right now, I put it in the strike position. I was not ready. No harness, no nothing. And uh, it was in the sand spike. And when I come tight on that thing, I jerked it out of the sand spike. And this was a 15-foot hammerhead. It's all, all, all over YouTube. It's all online. You Google largest hammerhead caught in the NC. You'll see it. It comes up, me, my sons, and all of us on it, some buddies that were with us. And and I literally sat in the sand, laid backwards, and this thing was dragging me towards the water. I mean, I couldn't back drag off on him. I was scared it was going to blow the reel up. I mean, it was kind of one of those things. They jumped in the harness, and we fought for an hour and 45 minutes, and we got this thing in. So, I mean, up and down the beach, in and out. I mean, it's a, a lot, but a lot of them are really hard runs to where that thing, a lot of times you can tell when it's a big hammerhead because when that thing hits, I mean, it, that thing is absolutely flying. I don't care how much drag you put on him, he's going. So it tiger's a little different. I mean, he kind of makes those, he'll make a burst and then you'll come tight on him and then he'll, you'll get him and he'll burst again. And, but they're not, not like a hammerhead. Hammerhead is just insane battle. Insane. So river. I got a question for you, man. If the typical charters that you do and, and not the spinner, but the big shark fishing, when that client who's paid you to go out there and do this land-based big shark fishing, they get strapped in. Do they usually see the fight to the end or do they usually say, I've had enough. Someone else help me out. Usually they um, say I had enough, but we do get a couple people that want to fight it all the way to the end. And a typical charter, I mean, again, I know everything's different, but a typical charter would start at what time and end at what time? Really all depends. You can go from in the morning until 
the afternoon or you could we could start in the afternoon and go through the night well right on i think I think I'm at the end of my questions, man. I mean, I've enjoyed this. And again, I'm coming from a place of not much knowledge. I hope I've done you guys justice. Is there oh, anything yeah. we haven't covered? Anything I haven't asked? Anything you're thinking, I wish I would have said that? Because otherwise, I think we're at the end of the discussion, you know, at least the starter conversation. No, I mean, we've cut, covered pretty much all of it. And in all honesty, it's kind of one of those things, man. It, it's... uh it's not a it, it's how do i how do i how can i say this like i've said before shark fishing i mean it takes a little bit it takes some technique but in all honesty in my opinion it's not like drum fishing where you're constantly chasing 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 standing there casting and really when you're putting these big baits in the water like this man shark fishing reminds me of catching cat fishing throw it out leave it sit and just hope something bites it i mean that's the deal with these big sharks i mean it really is i i there's a little bit of i would say science to it but it's it's a it's kind of self-explanatory i mean it's just having the gear not everybody has the you know, ability to to have these you know a, a setup you got a 1500 dollars reel with a 750 dollars custom rod you know, not everybody can just go out and buy those things to target big sharks. So, I mean, you know, but again, we we pretty much covered it all, and it's 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 easy as it gets, man. It, it, just get it. The biggest thing is getting it out there and letting it sit. All right, I That's did come it. up with one more question. So, yep. what what's the etiquette, man? Are you expected to sort of go off and be by yourself? I'm guessing you don't go someplace like the point where that collects people who are doing other kinds of fishing. I'm guessing. You're kind of supposed to be out on your own or no, anything goes. Yeah, no, I don't, we, we steer most people away from the point. You do got a couple of donkeys out there. Well, I shouldn't have said that, but you do have some guys out there that, that have no respect for nobody else when it comes to, to shark fishing like that. And I mean, I get it. You know, the point is the point. If you want to go out and cast for these things, you know, like your drum fishing, that's great because you in the spring you'll catch a lot of sandbars and stuff out there too on the point. But to actually deploy baits out on the point, that's to me, that's just a disrespect to the guys that are out there that are trying to fish. So for an example, early fall, if there is a few drums showing up, I, I wouldn't have the goal to go out there in the middle of them guys and do it. And the biggest thing with shark fishing, when we're trying to target these real big sharks, 90% of the places we go are more of a walkover beach or, you know, we don't I try to stay away from people when we are doing this because you don't want to draw too much attention to it. That's like anything else, you know, I mean, it, it's you, you always have the ones that, you know, think it's just awful that we're catching sharks, but it's OK to go out and catch puppy drum, you know. So it, it's uh, and we don't kill them. We don't we don't very seldom ever, ever kill a shark. But, um, yeah, we, we try to stay with the guys we're fishing with and to ourselves. We don't, we don't advertise it like, hey, look at us, you know. And we would – the biggest thing is being courtesy about what we're doing. You know, we've had people holler at us. We've had people cuss us because they seem to think when we put these larger baits out in the water that we're chumming these sharks in, you know. And, and we try to educate them on what's going on. These sharks are here. We're not chumming anything in. We're doing the same thing that they're doing. You're pompano fishing. I'm shark fishing. So the bait's not chumming anything. I mean, it's we're just fishing for what's out there. Man, uh, I'm going to ask you to forgive another potentially dumb question. So does that hook come out of the shark's mouth, or is that just a cutaway? No, we do remove the hooks. Um, we have had a few that we have cut out. But, again, according to the state of North Carolina, in, in Florida, and I'm I'm not sure about you know South Carolina, Georgia. I'm not too sure about that, but um, it is a inline non stainless circle hook only. So it is a rod away hook. So it does it does rot away if we do have to cut it. It's not gonna stay in its mouth forever. So stainless hooks are illegal to shark fish with, and uh, along with J hooks and offset circles, it's got to be inline non stainless. So, um, but we do have a custom D hooker 
you know, you can't buy the D hooker that we have. It's a, a friend of ours and, and, you know, he, he's made us a couple custom D hookers, you know, to get these big hooks out of their mouth. All right. Well, Hey guys, I hope Brian, that people see this, hear this and now associate you as the shark rigging station on the East coast or, or North Carolina or Hatteras and river, man. I hope you get some charters out of this man. Cause if I were going to enter this forum, I would certainly want to see firsthand what's going on and not hear or watch a video. I would want to be out there with you guys and learn that way, you know, try to glean something of what you collected over the last 10, 20 years. But man, both oh, of yeah. you, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing. Always enjoy talking to you. Hey, real, real quick. Yeah. Um, uh, you did never did ask me that question, but no, I don't know the guy, but that room may have been 35 inches. <laughs> <laughs> he'd be 40 if you stretch him between trucks but no it, it, it was a, that was a 35 inch fish all day that was not 40 unless they wrapped the tape measure around him a couple times <laughs> fair I enough <laughs> great way to end brian hey river brian yeah. thanks again all right guys thank y'all all right billy <laughs> if you don't if you don't have a best takeaway from oh that episode my God, dude. then i no longer want to be your partner i want a new partner i mean all the takeaways because i'm i'm with you gary i don't know anything about this and you know i'm gonna be I, i'll admit like i thought oh this can be you know it's gonna be easy like go get some big rods big reels throw some bait out there and i'm glad brian and and, and river educated us that like you know, when he said, like, harness and $500 rod, $700 rod, I'm like, okay, you know what? I am – I put my Walmart gear up, and I'm going to go book a trip with these guys. But, dude, it got me fired up. And I think one of the things I was really honestly shocked about is the the distance from the beach that these sharks are. Like, you don't have to go out 800 to 1,000 yards, but 100, 200 yards, something like that, um, you know on a couple of reasons one i'm swimming out there so i'm just gonna keep in the inside the football field distance <laughs> and then um you know i mean it's good news because if you're on your kayak and you're old school and you're just god i mean just badass dude that's what i was thinking the whole time like this is badass like but anyway be safe out there if you try to shark fish go book a trip with one of these guys i mean it's worth if you're in this area in wilmington that's worth a, a trip that's worth an overnighter and uh, it sounds fun man my blood is boiling yeah, man. I mean, I, I knew these guys. I knew they were going to be professional about yeah. this. I knew it was going to be a safety. I knew there was going to be a conservation, man. I knew they weren't messing around. I knew, you know, they've given all this a lot of thought and, you know, had it dialed in. I mean, still I was taken aback by just the commitment of Damn. the task on several levels. But, man, right? Like, watching that, listening to that, I'm ready to go out to Hatteras, man. I'm yeah. I'm not ready to shell out the cash. I'm, I'm ready to tell Pay River to say, man, show me something, man. Yeah, right? And yeah. then make sure I trust him before he ra before he puts me in that <laughs> harness. Gotta look him in the eye and be like, we're cool, right, River? We're cool. <laughs> I know we've been sitting here for a few hours. I made, made some bad jokes, but I know. he was setting me up right, right? <laughs> well, man, I was sitting here thinking, like, God, I shouldn't have lost, you know, because I've lost a bit of weight. I'm like, that's probably not good. That shark would drag me all the way in the water. Anyway, too much fun, man. That got me fired up. Hopefully you guys got fired up, you know, about it as well. And, uh, and yeah, go support our sponsors, Marine Warehouse Center, Bland Landscaping, Academy Sports for this episode. And we really appreciate those guys. And go check out our inshore fishing reports as well if you haven't. Fishermanspost.com. And, Gary, we'll see you in the next one, man. Next one. Fisherman's Post.